السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي. الحمد لله رب العالمين القائل في محكم تنزيله بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون صدق الله العظيم ثم الصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه نجوم الدجا والمسلمين أما بعد أبرز أبوت الله سبحانه وتعالى May peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless him and also to bless his family members, his companions, and all Muslim ummah till the day of judgment. My respected brothers and sisters in Islam, the topic of our lecture today is Limada Nasum Fi Shahr Ramadan. Why do we fast in the month of Ramadan? Limada Nasum Fi Shahr Ramadan. Why do we fast in the month of Ramadan? My respected brothers and sisters, before I speak more about the reasons why we fast in the month of Ramadan, I would like to advise you and myself, as usual, that let us have taqwa, let us fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم اتق الله حيثما كنت أو بروفيت محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم سيد في الله سبحانه وتعالى wherever you are you have to fear الله سبحانه وتعالى as we all know that we we have left with few days so that we may get into this blessed month of Ramadan, the month of Ihsan, the month of Iman, the month of Sobu, the blessed month of Ramadan. We are now closer to the month of Ramadan. So we Muslims, we fast in this coming month of Ramadan for the reasons. And if anyone who is not a Muslim, he's a non-Muslim, if he asks us why we Muslims fast in the month of Ramadan, it is very essential for each and every Muslim to know why we Muslims fast in this coming month of Ramadan. So we Muslims fast in the month of Ramadan because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to do so. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is our creator, our sustainer commanded us to do so. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command us to fast in this month of Ramadan? The first thing that we have to know is that we are the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
We are the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to fast in this coming month of Ramadan. Yes, we are the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are not qualified to be his enemies. We are not qualified to be the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as we are Muslims, we are qualified to be ibadullah, the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, we are not even qualified to be his partners. Na'ud billahi min dhalik. We are not qualified to be the partners of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My respected brothers and sisters, as we are closer to this month of Ramadan, we must know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to fast because we are the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm sorry I was giving this lecture because the one who was supposed to come here, we didn't see him. Now I think he's around so he can continue with his lecture. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Our, speaker, our second speaker today is Dr. Akhtar Teo. Dr. Akhtar is the chairman of the Islamic Medical Association of Pretoria, and today's topic is the medical aspects of fasting. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My talk today is supposed to be on the medical aspects of fasting. We heard the ayah from the brother, which was from Surah Baqarah, which said, O oh, you who believe, fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you, so that you may learn self restraint. And the key aspect of fasting is this aspect of self-restraint. But further, in the surah that follows, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us some concessions. And he says, if any of you is ill or, or, or on a journey, the prescribed number should be made up from later on. So there is some concession and there is already recognition given in the Quran that not everybody will be able to fast in the month of Ramadan. But certainly, the majority who are well and healthy should be fasting. And we should do everything in our power to try and help these people to complete this great obligation and this blessing which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in the month of Ramadan. So we have people that are what we call acutely ill, and that means they will have something like a pneumonia or a heart attack or something. They are unable to fast. Those people will make up for that fast subsequently. But there are those that are chronically ill, that have got medical illnesses from which they cannot fast. So they may have insulin-dependent diabetes, bleeding peptic ulcers, kidney stones that recur if they fast and are unable to fast. Those pe people then will make up for the fasting by giving away what is known as kafara. Kafara is the feeding of one that is indigent for the day. So the number of days that they must will be made up with this kafara. So in terms of fasting itself, uh, it itself has, alhamdulillah, it has a physiological changes with fasting which are indescribable. <coughs> The body responds to fasting in a phenomenal way. 
we have in the liver stores of glucose, which we call glycogen. And as soon as we start fasting, the body starts breaking down that glycogen stores from the liver and also from muscle tissue. And that then gives us the energy or the glucose that is formed in the blood. So it's very rare for any normal person who is fasting according to the Islamic principles, particularly if you're fasting from dawn to dusk, to actually become hypoglycemic. Because your body manufactures the glucose from the glycogen and from the muscle tissue. So it's unlikely that you're going to have low sugar. But children, they don't have developed systems. So they don't have adequate stores of glycogen in their body. And so they may become hypoglycemic. That's why we don't encourage children to fast for a whole day. And often in our Muslim customs, we know we start training children to start fasting by keeping half a day's fast. That is about what they can manage. So physiologically, they cannot manage more than that. But Alhamdulillah, the body adapts to fasting. We tend to concentrate the body, the water. We do not pass as much water as we would otherwise. And so there is adaptation to fasting. However, the adaptation is not complete. Some parts of the body, for example, the brain, do not get enough energy, for example, and so you may become a little bit sluggish, and we all find that during Ramzan we're a little bit slow. Sometimes there's not enough sugar and people get angry, okay? So they lose their temper. So that happens. And in fact, they've done studies, uh, there's been a study done on Moroccan Air Force pilots, where they've shown that their reaction time slows down. So, for example, in the Air Force, in most Muslim countries, and also the pilots, they are not allowed to fast because they are worried that if they slow down, they might cause an accident or uh, the plane, they may not be able to fly, fly the plane adequately. Now, we know that in order to help us to fast adequately, we need to try and improve the way we have whatever illnesses we have. So there are certain illnesses that we find we may have to make adaptations for. So for example, I will give it the patients who have diabetes. Now diabetes has different types of diabetes. There's what we call the non-insulin dependent diabetes and the insulin dependent diabetes. Of the insulin dependent diabetes, there's two types as well. One which you can just treat with diet alone and one which you need medication to treat with. And then from the insulin-dependent diabetes, you normally need insulin. So the non-insulin-dependent diabetics, they actually benefit from fasting, because what happens is that their sugar control gets better, particularly those that are diet-dependent, because if they don't take as much sugar during the day, they are able to, to get better sugar control, and in fact, over the period of the month, their sugar is much better. Those that are what we call oral dependent diabetics, they take tablets for their diabetes, they also benefit from the fast. But they have to be a little bit careful, because if they are taking their medication twice a day, they may have periods in which their sugar levels may drop too low. So the recommendation for diabetics that are on medication is to swap the treatment. So if you are taking two tablets in the morning and one at night, uh, because your nighttime sugars are, le are lower normally, you would have to do it the other way around. You would have to take one tablet at seri and two tablets at night when you break your iftar, because that's the time when you are now going to be eating a lot more. So you need to make an adjustment for that. As far as the insulin-dependent diabetics, it's generally not recommended that they should fast. However, there are uh, some, even amongst that group, who are able to fast. And there are techniques these days to advise you how to do that. There are patients that are on what we call the basal bolus regime. That means they take one long-acting insulin injection. And with every meal, they take small amounts of insulin with it. So those kind of patients get fast because they can adjust the amount of the long-acting insulin. And then they can take extra insulins at seri and at iftar. And if they're going to be having a snack at night, etc. So they can still sometimes fast. But generally speaking, it's not recommended that they fast. Patients, for example, with peptic ulcer disease, 
If you've got bleeding ulcers, you definitely shouldn't be fasting. Okay, you need treatment at that stage, and it's not worth your while to fast because the fasting itself is going to increase the amount of acid that you produce, and it may worsen your bleeding. However, if you don't have bleeding ulcers, if you've got stable controlled ulcers, you can fast. You can take your medication at any time. That will decrease the amount of acid that you have in the, in the body, and you shouldn't have any problems. And in fact, many of the times, because they got associated what we call gastric acid reflux from filling of the stomach, in fact, those patients also do better because the stomachs are relatively empty for a long period of time during the day, and so they, they also sometimes even heal better during Ramadan. Like that, we have many other diseases, angina, heart problems, etc. You need to look at specifically at your disease and see whether it is possible to fast. If it's possible to fast, sometimes it's better to adjust before Ramadan to do one or two practice fasts and change your habits and your diets and your medication. You should consult your doctor for that and advice from them may help you to fast, uh, even if previously you might not have been able to. These days we have extended release tablets, so the tablets can work for a whole day and sometimes even for two days. And so it may not be necessary for you to take frequent medication during the day. You could take it at seri or at iftar time and so you can adjust your medication. Uh, most medications these days are available in either once or twice daily formulations. Uh, and so with consultation with your doctor, you can adjust to that. Then we often get asked questions about what should we do, what, what is permissible and what is not permissible uh, from a medical point of view during the day. So obviously we know that oral medication is not permissible. You can't take anything through the mouth. Okay. So any type of oral medication during the day is not permissible. Eye drops and nose drops and ear drops do get absorbed through the mouth, so they are also not recommended generally by all the mouth. Okay, so we don't recommend that. As far as asthma pumps and inhalers go, there's a bit of controversy. The majority of ulama say they are not permissible. There are few that do permit it, particularly more in the Middle East, but most of the ulama do not permit in an inhalation uh, through any device, and they suggest that you should take the medication again at seri and iftar and there again there are inhalers that last long you can take it in the morning and in the evening then as far as injections go injections of any form are permissible because they go directly into the blood and there's no passing through the gastric system so injections of any sort are permissible however one has to weigh up if you are having an injection is it really worth your while to fast because you may not be well enough to fast. You can also have blood tests done, that's permissible as well. Uh, you cannot have an anesthetic done because you lose your consciousness. Loss of consciousness breaks the fast, so an anesthetic is not permissible. Scopes, which are done through the stomach or the uh, colonoscopies or barium studies are not permissible. However, if you have what's called an angiogram, that is permissible because the, uh, once again the dye is directly injected into the blood system itself. So those are some of the things as far as adjustments go in terms of what therapy you are allowed. Then another issue that often arises in Ramadan is that we get changes in the, in the body physiology and so, so we know a lot of people complain about things. Many people get headaches and headaches most commonly are due to often things like caffeine withdrawal because you take tea frequently during the day or the colas, you don't realize that when you stop taking them, you are going to be getting headaches. But it may also be due to other factors like lack of sleep, not having adequate nutrition, etc. Then bowel habits are often also affected in, in Ramadan. That again, once again, is due to a change in diet. You are recommended to have diet that contains mainly fat and protein and a lot of fiber in the diet. The fiber will help to digest your food. And don't have sweet stuff, particularly carbonated drinks and your uh, other type of uh, carbohydrates. Complex carbohydrates which take long to break down are better for you. 
but sugars are not good for you. Fried foods, for example, are also another source of problems in, in Ramadan. We know we like to have a lot of samosas, and bhajiyas and things like that in Ramadan, but they are not good for you. Limit yourself in terms of that. Foods like halim, for example, are not bad because they contain fairly complex carbohydrates, they are fairly nutritious, there are fluid within them as well, but once again, some people may not tolerate them well from their bowel aspects. Milk may be tolerable as well, and it would be a good substitute for carbonated beverages. And the best still is water. As far as water goes, the recommendations are that you must rehydrate yourself between your time when you break your seri up to the time you go and sleep. That is the best time to imbibe water and rehydrate yourself. Particularly people that are prone to kidney stones and things like that. Uh, if, you, if you take too much water at seri time, all you're going to do is pass the water out early in the day and you won't have much left. So you rather rehydrate yourselves at night, but hydration is very important. It will help your digestion, it will help prevent kidney stones, it will prevent, <laughs> help prevent low blood pressure and other complications that may arise such as that. Uh, if you have any questions, there is the website of the Islamic Medical Association. There is information on the website, so I would recommend that you, you can Google Islamic Medical Association of South Africa. And on the website, we'll have some uh, pamphlets and, and guidelines that are there available for you. Uh, from the IMA side, we wish you well over the fast of Ramadan. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you all good health and that you don't need help from any of us during that month, but please bear in mind to look after your health, because if you look after your health, you then subsequently are obviously well enough to do the most important things for Ramadan, which is your ibadah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. for taking our time and talking today in this masjid. A reminder, Tarawih Salah will be performed in this masjid throughout Ramadan, led by Sheikh Muhammad Atayah, who is the mom, imam of this masjid. Azan is at 7 p.m. There will be security in the parking lot, and we request people to attend in the numbers. Jazakallah.